takes a little lot longer to, to get there, five, ten minutes at least. So um, Exodus 20 is where we're going to be. But before we dump into the word, how many days are we from the election? Nine? Is it nine days? I know some of you are like, really? Yeah, really. Nine days until the election, uh, and in the words of Bill Clinton, get out early and get out often to vote. So I, I appreciate those words. Vote early, vote often. That's what I, I like that, too. Or was it George Bush? I don't know, one of those guys from the 90s. So um, it is a true uh, honor and privilege to live in this country. It is a, an incredible uh, responsibility to be a part of what goes on in our country and our culture. And uh, if you're not a voting believer, then uh, you have no reason to say anything about anything. Uh, so get out. Let your, uh, let your voice be known. Uh, don't do it in an unchristlike way. Don't do it in an unloving way. Um, we're all part of the same tribe called humanity, and we all need Jesus. There's no reason for us to be nasty with each other. Amen? Uh, the reason we're talking about the election is because it's coming up in nine days, and I'm hopefully, hopefully you're getting out to, to vote. Uh, there's a lot going on nationwide that we need to be aware of. There's a lot going on statewide that we need to be aware of. But lest you think politics is uh, somehow separate from our spirituality, you're mistaken. The greatest political entity that exists in the world is the church of God. We model for people a different kind of ethic. And so politics is first seen and expressed in the church. And we need to be in lockstep with what God would want for our society. And just so you're aware, God is a pro-life God. God is a pro-immigration God. Those tend to be the hot topics, right? And it's not called uh, reproductive rights. I, that is such a misnomer. It's called reproductive responsibilities. Pastor Scott coined that about three months ago, so... Uh, this is, you have no rights. We have no rights as people, but yet we like to think we have rights. Can I lay one on you real thick, real fast? The only right you have is to con be condemned forever apart from God's love and hell. That's the only right we have. But we have responsibilities. And praise God for grace. Amen? Praise God for mercy. Praise God for compassion. Praise God for kindness. So, God is a pro-life God. But he's also a pro-immigrant God. How many times in the scripture he says, welcome the foreigner in. Welcome the stranger in. Don't build walls. Allow people to have a place where they can flourish and thrive. Can I get an amen? See, with that, I've offended both sides of the aisle. So I'm an equal opportunity offender. So lest you think you're following one political party or the other, you're not part of the donkey, you're not part of the elephant, you're part of the lamb if you're in God's church. And so be nice, be kind, praise God you won't stand before Jesus one day and he's going to plot your voter record and determine whether you're deserving of heaven or not. You're deserving of heaven, why? Because of his infinite grace and mercy through his son Jesus Christ. That's the only reason we have any sort of hope is because of Jesus. Amen. So let's pray. Let's pray for our country. Let's pray for our citizenship. Let's represent, uh, represent something better. Because guess what we're going to do? We're going to talk about the Ten Commandments in the coming weeks. And we need to be dialed in to what is precious and important to the heart of God. And the Ten Commandments show us this. The Ten Commandments is, is probably one of the most important things ever given to us by God. But it's probably the mis most misunderstood thing. As well, And so that's why today is kind of an intro to the Ten Commandments because we need to talk about this thing called the law, the law of God, because the law seems pretty harsh, right? The law seems very impersonal. The Bible talks about the law of God repeatedly, and the law of God is not a bad thing. But unfortunately, I think we've misconstrued the Ten Commandments or the law of God, and we've made it into something that really doesn't reflect the Father's heart. So when we talk about abortion or immigration or even character or kindness, right, these are all reflected in God's, God's heart and his desire for humanity to thrive and flourish. This is why the, that God created Adam and Eve, right? He said, be fruitful, multiply, bring good to this thing that I've created called the world. And so uh, the values of our society are reflected in things that we hold precious because your political voting reflects a worldview, 
And my question is, whose worldview are you following? Are you following your own worldview or are you following God's worldview? Because eight billion worldviews colliding against each other will not end up a pretty scene. We need one worldview, and that's God's worldview. So when Lori and I will do premarital coaching with couples, one of the exercises we'll do with these couples is we, we, we ask them to compile a top ten list of uh, the top ten commandments of the household they grew up in. What were the Ten Commandments of your home growing up? So whether you're engaged, you're married, you're single, this is actually a really good exercise. Take a moment, not right now, but at some point, write down the Ten Commandments of your house growing up. Because every one of us probably grew up in a household where there are rules, right? Does anyone want to rattle off one or, or two right now? What, were, what was maybe one of the commandments of your home growing up? Adam, finish your plate which meant you just did not leave any food behind, right? You literally left no crumbs. All right, amen, I like that. Rod, be on time. Or in my household, early is on time, on time's late, right? Now here's the thing, is finish your plate or clean your plate and be on time found in the Ten Commandments in the Word of God. No. So what's interesting is we create commandments that in marriage, oftentimes, this is why we do it with, with couples, is that they bring Ten Commandments into their marriage without having to talk about the Ten Commandments. And when your commandments don't line up with my commandments, there's conflict. Right? The woman could say to the man, my dad always did car repairs. Why aren't you? Right? Or the man could say, my mommy always got me breakfast in bed. Why don't you? And you could see how marriage can be fraught with difficulties if we all bring in our list of Ten Commandments to our home when we haven't even talked through those things. And so I'm not here, and you don't want me to hear what I believe about the world, about life, about, about spirituality, about whatever. We need to get on one page, and that's not each other's page. This, this is God's page. Right? We're all bringing Ten Commandments in here. You know, the world encourages you to you do you. Come up with your own list of morals. Come up with your own list of values and ethics. And the moment someone doesn't jive with what you hold dear, there's conflict. What we need to recognize is that it's not about your rules, and it's not about my rules. It's about God's rules. But unless understood, even God's rules can be horribly handled. And so we're going to talk about this this morning. In Exodus, turn to Exodus chapter 20. It's interesting, in the New Testament, you won't find the phrase Ten Commandments. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, you won't find the phrase Ten Commandments. Three times a word appears in its decalogue. And literally it means ten words. There are ten words that God has given Israel. And it's interesting because up to this point, God has only talked to Moses. And Moses takes then God's words to the people. This is the only instance where God invites all of Israel, two million people, to the mountain to say a word to all of them. And it's only the ten words. Once God says the ten words to Israel, they're dismissed, and then God just talks to Moses from there on out. So the only he, time he talks to the community is by giving them these ten words, or as we like to call them, the ten commandments. Isn't that interesting? And so he wants everyone to be aware of these ten words. And the word for word literally is a royal edict or a command from the king. So there's this weightiness to what God gives to the people and says, because I'm the king, because I'm the great sovereign, I am letting you all in on what is near and dear to my heart for you. No other work of antiquity contains th this kind of powerful message. No other religious system in the world has 
what is communicated in the Decalogue from God to two million people called Israel. And it wasn't for Israel alone because all the things found in the Ten Commandments are all things that have already been at play in humanity from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite parts of this journey is going to be connecting Old Testament commands, Ten Commandments, with how they're reflected in the New Testament. Because Jesus affirms every single one of these things. This is why the law is not just for the Old Testament. The law is also New Testament, and the law is for us. And so we're going to take just a few moments to talk about why this is important this morning. We're going to set up a proper understanding of the commandments. Because, again, if misunderstood, these can do incredible damage and destruction because oftentimes we don't understand them in its proper context. Let's read the passage. If you would stand with me as we read Exodus 20, verse 1 through 17. Verse 1, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven or above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord God, am a jealous God visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male, your female servants, your cattle, the sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or female servant or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Yeah, you may have a seat. So we're not going to get into the 10 words, the 10 commandments this morning, but this is merely a refresher for all of us to go, wow, okay, I... I most of us probably couldn't rattle off all Ten Commandments, right? The, the man or woman on the street, if pressed last minute, surprisingly was asked, you know, what are the Ten Commandments? We could probably rattle off a few of them. But it's interesting to read them in their t context, but it's going to be interesting to navigate one per week after today and to really understand what's going on with these. Now, let me show you why this is going to be powerful because notice how this starts with what God says in verse 2. And this is the first point. God's goodness. The ten words or the ten commandments are set in a context of relationship. They're not abstract rules that God just says, I'm going to throw these at you. Hey, good luck obeying the rules of my household. No, no, no. He sets up what he has to say to his people in the context of something he's already demonstrated to them. Look at what verse 2 says. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So again, contextually, God does not begin with the law. He begins with the gospel. God's law is given in the context of God's grace. And if we don't understand the gospel or grace, the law can be damaging and destructive and deadly. So God wants Israel to know, first the gospel, then the law. Isn't it cool that God didn't go to Egypt and say, all right, now the great deliverance is about ready to happen, so here's the Ten Commandments. All of you follow those, and once you follow them perfectly, I'll rescue you. 
praise God for his deliverance that while we're yet sinners, Christ dies for us. He gives us grace, and then he shows us law. See, God isn't only their Lord. He's their Redeemer. This is why we lead gospel-centered lives, cross-focused lives. Because as you probably heard me teach before, parenting, probably the most important rules for parenting are these. Are you ready for this? Rules without relationship will lead to rebellion, where relationship without rules will lead to resentment. So think about this. Some of you probably grew up in a home where there was a lot of authority, there was a lot of rules, but there was very little affection. There was very little, I love you, I'm proud of you. There was probably a little physical touch, there was probably a little, little hugging. What happens when a child grows up in a home where there's rules and no relationship? They rebel. Any rebels in the midst? Just curious. Just raise your hand. You're in good. Hi, welcome. Rebels. Two hands? Okay. Legs? I don't know. Whatever. So, but then there's homes where there's a lot of affection, there's a lot of relationship, but there's no rules. Because you don't see your role as a parent. You see your role as a friend. I'm going to be my child's buddy. Why would I bring anything harsh to the relationship? I just want to have fun with my kids. Well, your child will resent you later when there's only relationship and no rules. Someone once said, pick when, you're ch you, when you want your child to hate you, either early on or later on, because it will happen. Take those truths and now apply them to God. If you had a God that wasn't interested in relationship but only wanted to bring rules, we would be rebels to the end. But thank goodness he's not a God who's so sloppy in his affection with his creation that he just says, do whatever you want, and we're still good. That would not be a God who is holy, just, righteous, merciful. So you see how God as a divine parent, which is what he's saying to us, has set up these rules because when you experience God's grace and redemption, you're no longer in the courthouse of a judge. You've been invited into the household of God. He's your father. He's no longer your enemy. You're no longer the outcast that is disobedient and rebellious to the end. You have been loved and accepted by him. Now there is no courthouse judge saying guilty because he has delivered you from that guilt through his love and sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. So you see why this is important. This is why I personally am not necessarily a fan of saying Let's go ahead and throw Ten Commandments up in our schools and our courthouses. Matter of fact, this week, Louisiana is facing, at their highest level of courts, this issue. We want to post the Ten Commandments in our classrooms. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I'm against a moral code or a moral standard. I think these things are important. But when we push rules as believers... And we don't somehow use this as a context to first share the gospel. Your society is going to rebel. People are going to reject you. We're seeing it in politics. We're seeing it in our communities. We're seeing it in our society. Because all they have heard and all that they have seen and all that they have felt is are people who say they love Jesus trying to cram rules down their throat. And I would say for the church, let's be less zealous about the Ten Commandments and more zealous about the Sermon on the Mount. Some of you are like, what's that? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Take two Sermon on the Mounts, call me in the morning, let me know you're feeling better about yourself. <laughs> Kurt Vonnegut, famous author. Some of you probably read some of his stuff in school. Slaughterhouse Five, things like this. Not a believer. 
He said, I'm not against the Ten Commandments, but what I'm against are Christians who don't follow the Sermon on the Mount in their own lives. Even he recognized how the Sermon on the Mount really does talk about the Ten Commandments, but it does it in a way that welcomes conversation, encourages relationship, and is not just about rules. Rules without relationship will lead you to be legalist. And as far as I know, we don't need any more legalists. Can I get an amen? Some of you think you have the spiritual gift of being a Pharisee. You're wrong. So rules without relationship lead to rebellion or legalism. Relationship without rules will lead to resentment or licentiousness. There's a balance. This morning I want to strike that balance with what we're going to talk about. And here's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. The Ten Commandments is all about God's guidance. Point number two. I'm going to tell you right now, lots of verses. Get ready because you're going to want to look at these later on. I would encourage this. I believe this is a holy moment. Whenever God's word is open, whenever God's people are present, whenever the spirit is working, we would do well to take what we're learning here and take it with us this week and forever. I'm going to give you a ton of verses. Whoever's doing slides, Paula, you get extra copy today. Davey gets extra copy for even entering these, these, these verses in. And when I say lots of verses, I mean lots of verses. So if we understand the commandments as God's guidance, I think there's five rules we need to remember in order to understanding the law of God or the commandments in a healthy way. And we're going we're gonna to make this a graduated journey. So there's five G's that we're going to talk about. It's going to be God, guard, guilt, gospel, and guide. So that's where we're going to go. First point is this, God's guidance. And the fact that the law reflects God's character. So remember, Egypt has held Israel captive for 400 plus years. Here's what I know as a believer in Christ. God saved me at 15 there was a lot of my 15 years that wasn't healthy in understanding him or myself when it came to the gospel. Some of you have come to know Jesus later on in life. How many of you came to know the Lord maybe in your 20s? Raise your hand. How many of you in your 30s? Just So 40s, anyone? So you think about if you live a life for so long in a certain culture with your sin nature and not understanding God's love, it takes a long time to understand your new identity, right? And so Israel has been under Egypt captivity for 400 plus years. They have lost sight of who they are. And so God is telling them, listen, I'm not giving you instructions to get out of Egypt. I've already brought you out of Egypt. Now I'm giving you instructions on how to live as a free people because you are truly free. Let me guide you. Now, now, with this comes some interesting things, and, I'm, and I know I'm going to help a lot of people out here, because when it comes to the law of God, it's not as simple as, as we would think. Um, in the Bible, there are really three types of law that God gives. You ready for this? Bonus points. Write them down in your, in your outline. Number one, there's ceremonial law. Number two, there's civil law. And number three, there's moral law. This is important because on social media, people are... People are like, well, why don't these Christians, if they're so zealous for God, why are they m wearing clothes with mixed fabrics? Because doesn't Leviticus say you should only wear cotton only? <laughs> so there's people that, you know, who have no understanding of Scripture, but go, well, you as a person who loves Jesus, the Bible says if you're a practicing homosexual, you should be killed and stoned to death. Isn't that what Levitical law says? And then we as Christians are like, oh, like we're so confused. Because it's in the Bible. And what we don't understand is that there's three nuances of God's love. Ceremonial law, which was only for Israel that acted as shadows or prefigurements of Christ. And they're no longer practiced. Why? Because Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. Christ is the ultimate priest. Christ is the ultimate sanctuary. So... Ceremonial law is no longer on the table. It was for a time, and it all pointed to the coming arrival of the Messiah. Two, civil law was for Israel and how it conducted itself among all the nations of the world at that time. 
This is why they were called to be a set-apart people. This is why they were called a holy nation and a royal priesthood. Those civil laws are no longer applicable because Israel is no longer a theocratic nation in the sense of the spiritual people that God is building. That is what we call the church. The church existed in the Old Testament, and it exists in the New Testament, and it is not bound by earthly boundaries or borders. We are not a nation on earth. We are a, a holy nation whose citizenship is in heaven. But then there's the third nuance, and that's moral law. The moral law is binding on all humans from the beginning until the end. These are the things that are communicated from Genesis to Revelation, given by the creator to govern the moral conduct of all creatures for all times. So God being the designer, God being the lawgiver, says this is how creation should operate, right? You buy a car, you spend, I don't know, what's the cost of a car? I don't own new cars. I'm a pastor, and I love Jesus. But, you know, some, some of you bought a new car recently, you know, say $60,000. What can you buy for $60,000? I don't know. You go, what is it? What kind of? Ford truck? All right, say cool Ford pickup truck. The owner's manual says use only 87 octane gas. And you sit there and go, Psh, I'll put whatever I want in there. And you start putting Sunny D in your gas tank. <laughs> How long is that truck going to operate and function well? I don't know. Someone want to do it as an experiment and get back to us on this? It's not going to operate. Why? Because you have taken the, the wisdom of the maker and have trashed it and brought your own wisdom to the table. There are certain laws that are binding on all, all people. This is what we have to recognize, and we're going to talk about here in a bit. So God, why does he give this law? It reflects his character. He wants you to understand he's a righteous, holy, moral God. Leviticus 19.2. What does it say? It says this. Speak to all the congregation of the people for, of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. I will sh throw this out at you, and we'll talk about it later. Holiness is God's central characteristic. This is his most central attribute. It's not love. God is the God of love. But love comes out of his holiness. Grace comes out of his holiness. Justice comes out of his holiness. Holiness is the most important thing you can understand about God. Now, what does he say? Reflect my holiness in your life. How many of us have failed at that just today? <laughs> yeah, we're all in need of help. We're all in need of help, right? God introduces the law by saying, be holy for I am holy. In other words, you want to know who I am? You want to know what I love, what I hate? You want to know my heart? Then become like me, obey my law. But, like I also said, he also does this in a context of love. This is why Jesus, when pressed on the commandments in Matthew 22, he says this. And I love, here's what Christ says. He, he just, he simplifies it. People, dummy, this is like dummy theology. D theology for dummies. This is, this is it right here. He says to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So what is it? Love God, love people. And it's not necessarily in order. It's holistic. So you can't use an excuse like, I can't love my neighbor because they're different than me politically and love God. You must love God and love people. And it's an organic whole. You can't separate the two. And I love what Jesus does here, right? He says we love God by worshiping him, using his name properly. God says in the Ten Commandments, love your parents by honoring them. Love your spouses by being faithful to them. Love your neighbors by protecting their lives, respecting their property, telling them the truth. I mean, this is, this is what it's about. So they say something. The commandments reflect God's character. They say something about his honor, his worth, his majesty. And here's the cool thing, guys. Maybe you don't see it as cool. I don't know. We'll see. Because we are now the presence of God in our world, 
we as God's people are called to reflect his character. So the church has a responsibility to be the billboards for the Lord. The advertisements for Jesus. And I wonder how many of us just aren't doing this well. Guilty. Anyone else guilty? The world will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And so we are called to reflect God's character. And they, Israel, failed to obey God's law. Thus, they failed to manifest God to the nations. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to tell you why this is, this is problematic. Point number two. Guard. The law restrains society's sin. So the law acts as a guardrail. And none of us are opposed to guardrails. Right? I've driven on some pretty sketchy, steep mountain roads where there's a switchback and I'm driving a 15-passenger van and then there's a semi coming the other way. You know what I'm not doing is I'm not looking at the guardrail that someone took time and money to build and go, curse that guardrail. I wish there wasn't one so that my car could potentially plummet 1,000 feet down the ravine. I'm going, thank you that there is this protective element that is going to make this very scary moment a little less scary. <laughs> right? What we have to recognize is that the laws of God are universal in character. Matter of fact, this is Paul's argument in Romans chapter 2. Look what he says in, in verse 14, 15. If you want to understand a little bit more on what we're talking about, Romans' first three chapters really sets up what we're talking about today, right? Romans 1 says God has made himself known in creation. No one is without excuse. There's enough to know there's a God who exists. But there's nothing in creation that tells you that this God who exists is a God who saves you and redeems you. Chapter 2 of Romans says, if you don't think create, a creation testifies to this presence of this God, your conscience says everyone is born with this innate sense of right, wrong, good, and evil. Right? You don't have to tell a two-year-old not to steal because when they're with their little buddy and their, their little friend has a little truck that they just really want that kid like looks around make sure the parents are watching and be like Kick! and all of a sudden the other kid's like ah! like what's going on little johnny so and so stole and the kid knows like i've done something wrong this is innate within every single human being paul uses this and says for when the gentiles who not, do not have the law so the jews were given the law the gentiles were not but even though the gentiles weren't given the law they're not off the hook when by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So every single person, and this is what I love about C.S. Lewis in his book, The Abolition of Man, he argues that there is a certain universal mor morality among men and women. And he gives concrete examples of how cultures in the past and even cultures in the present are, uh, were able or are able to agree on the basics of morality because these principles are implanted in the heart mind of every single person born. Amen? Every person knows, right? So all cur cultures have said murder is wrong. You will, not, you will not go to a culture anywhere in the world and they say, murder's good, come, murder. Like, how's that for a tourism campaign? Like, you have vengeance in your blood? Come to our country and, 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 and murder somebody. Like, you don't have this. People universally know murder is wrong. They also recognize kindness is good. Isn't it interesting that there's this message of kindness that's kind of permeated our world as if kindness is the new apologetic? All agree that we have particular obligations to our family. All believe honesty is good, that a man cannot have any woman he wants. They agree, agree stealing is wrong. Justice is good. There are no cultures where cowardice and bravery, uh, cowardice is good and bravery is bad. Here's the good news. Can I just, a little caveat. This is why 
when you are ready to share the good news of Jesus Christ with somebody, you're not talking to somebody who is ignorant of these things. Everyone's got eternity in their hearts. Everyone knows there's a God who exists. So you're not starting from scratch. The wisdom comes in knowing how to connect the dots, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. Point three, it gets worse, but promise it's going to get better. Guilt. So because we all live in a moral universe, Everyone operates from a set of morality. Whether that morality is whatever you want morals to be or whether that morality, morality is set by God, therein lies the, the tension. But here is where we're brought to the end of ourselves, guilt. Pastor Tim Keller, who died last year, pastor out of uh, Manhattan, written some, written some amazing books. If you want to read uh, The Meaning of God, it's a great, he's kind of like the C.S. Lewis for the 21st century. You know, Keller would present the gospel in a context of talking to someone who doesn't know Jesus and ask him this question, what do you do with your guilt? What do you do with your guilt? Because Keller says, I know what I've done with my guilt. It's been taken by Jesus. What do you do with yours? Guilt, the law reveals humanity's need. So here's what the Bible says. The law is a mirror, and when you look at it and look into it, you really see an accurate picture of who you are. Some of you didn't look in the mirror today, I can tell, just by looking at you. Some of you maybe spent a little bit too much time in the mirror, you know what I'm saying? You ever go to like a, uh, like to a hotel? Maybe you have this. Maybe you, you know, your upper echelon crust of, of society. I've gone, Lori and I have gone to some hotels, and... The mirrors and the lighting makes everything just that much more pronounced. Like, I like our mirrors at our house because, you know what, they reflect, but they don't go into too much detail. But there's some mirrors I've looked at and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> right? Like, they're just, <laughs> right? And some of us, like, determine our day by how we look in the mirror, right? But here's what the mirror does. It reflects who you truly are, what you truly look like. But here's what the mirror cannot do. It cannot wash you or clean you. So the law of God written in creation, the law of God written in conscience, the law of God written in his word is enough to show you you fall short. We're all moral failures in need of help. Look at what Paul says in Romans 3.20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And that's where you go, that's a no duh moment, Paul. Right? And this is why people probably are saying, I don't want 10 commandments in the classroom. I don't want 10 commandments in the courtroom. But they could say no and not have those things posted. But guess where it's still posted? In their hearts. See, Paul says this in Romans chapter 7, right? He says this in, in verses 7 through 11 of Romans, what then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet. If the law had said, you shall not covet, he continues in verse 8. We'll keep going. Did I give you more? Yeah, there we go. But, but sin, seizing the opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all sorts of covetousness. Right? Wet paint. What do we do? We touch it. Like, don't put the sign up because it's only going to exaggerate my, my rebellious nature. Like, don't step on it. Guess where I'm stepping? I'm stepping on it. And not just once. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. And this is what people feel, right? For sin sees an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. This is why the first point in your, in your notes under this subpoint here is morality for the unbeliever is fueled by guilt. Somehow they're trying to assuage what they know they're accountable for by just heaping on good works and trying to obey the law. 
But the word says if you're guilty on one point of the law, you're guilty of the entire law. Right? This is why people are mad and angry and crazy and psychos. <laughs> because innate within each of us is a moral code that's connected to a moral law giver. And if there's no connection between the two of those things, it kills us and destroys us. Guys, this is so important. James chapter 2, verse 10. If you don't believe me, check out James. James chapter 2, verse 10. I told you you're going to get a workout. Here we go. James 2, verse 10. You got it? Nope. Did I not give it to you? Okay. How about uh, Galatians 3.10? We got that one? Okay. Still write down James 2.10. Look at it later. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Why? Because you're trying to fulfill something apart from relationship. You're trying to do something you weren't designed to do alone. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Paul feels this tension, right? He says you can't separate morality from, from religion. There's a study recently done in England. If you ever want to know where America is going to go in the next 10, 20 years, look at where England currently is now. They did a poll there of English folks Of the Ten Commandments, which ones are important and worth following? Guess which ones they said were good, and guess which ones they said were bad? They said the first four we can do away with, but the last six are the ones we need to embrace. Here's what's interesting. If you know the commandments, the first four have to do with God. So what they're saying is, let's just get rid of God, but we like the do not steal do not murder, do not lie. They want morality apart from the moral lawgiver. If you don't understand and abide the first four, you'll, you'll be destroyed by the last six. And we're going to see why this is important. Galatians 2, 16 and 21. Paul says, if you're interested in the book of Galatians, the letter of Galatians, it's really about this tension between law and grace. Right? We, we don't want to produce a bunch of legalists, and that's what Paul's addressing to the Galatian church because people are coming in saying, work, 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 law, 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 and they're not understanding the gospel of grace. Right? It's, it's a combined thing. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Just so we're clear, it's Jesus who saves us, not your law-abiding behavior. Can I get an amen? amen? For also we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be, and we feel this. Galatians 3.21, he goes on to in the next chapter, in the next section, in, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? So he's basically saying, here's what I'm anticipating you saying, then do we not need the law? No, we need it. But we need someone who's going to abide by the law perfectly, and guess what? We're not it. Certainly not, for if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Morality keeping is not life giving. We do not preach a morally therapeutic deity, which is what a lot of our churches are, are peddling out. Six steps to being a better husband. Eight steps to be a better wife. I don't know if the order's like that. <laughs> Ten things to be a better parent. How to honor God with your wealth. And they're preaching good things, but they're divorced from the gospel. Why are we, why, are, why am I spending so much time on this? Because Princeton Religion Research Center, that'd be a fun place to hang out produced an article recently, and here's what the title said. Religion is gaining ground, but morality is losing ground. What does that title say? People are more spiritual, but they're less moral in understanding the edicts of their religion. This is happening in the church. That's why the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, 
Honor your mom and dad. Don't steal. Don't murder. Don't lie. Don't defraud anyone. You see what Jesus is doing there? Ten commandments. Do these and you shall live. Well, I've done those things, but notice he left out one of the commandments of the final six. Which one did he leave out? You shall not covet. And then Jesus goes, go sell all that you have and go give it to the poor. And that rich young ruler walked away heartbroken because he couldn't part with his stuff. See what Jesus does there? He says, we're all the type of people who could be like, man, I've got commandments one, two, three, four, six, eight, nine, ten. I'm good. Well, what about five and eight? Right? We're all, we're all good with the things that we feel we're good on and good with God, right? But when it comes to thou shall not covet my neighbor's wife, well, Jesus talks about that. Thou shall not lie. Well, we've all said pretty nasty things. Thou shall not bear false witness, right? The moment you call someone fool, you're guilty of the eternal fires of hell. This is what Jesus says. Back to politics. Think about the name calling. And not just what our politicians do, but what we do against the other side. Watch your mouth. Don't be a part of the nastiness, right? So just when you're starting to feel un, uh, very righteous about yourselves, here's Pastor Scott to pull the rug out from underneath you. You're welcome. God bless you. Let's pray and go home, right? No. A couple more things. Morality is fu- is for the believer is fueled by grace. So we're not preaching no morals, but we're preaching a morality for the believer that's fueled by grace. Galatians 3.24. Paul says this. We're going to go rather quickly. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Thank you, Jesus, right? Romans 5, 20, 21. Now the law came to increase the trespass, right? This is, the law exacerbates it in our hearts. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Yes! So that sin reigned in death, but grace might reign now through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is where we get to go to right now, right? Gospel. The law remedied in Christ's perfection. The law is a teacher. The law is a tutor. The law is this this pointer to something that we recognize we can't do, but Jesus has done, right? We are not called to obey the laws of God apart from relationship with him. We can no longer keep the Ten Commandments rightly unless we keep them in Christ, through Christ, and with a view to the all-surpassing greatness of Christ. Right? We need to understand Jeremiah 31, 33. Check this out. I love this. This is all about the new covenant, right? For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God does not give us a letter of the law written on stone, but he writes his perfect law on our hearts, And when that is met by the perfect righteousness of Jesus, you and I now can cry out in a song, you are my God, and we hear God singing to us, you are my people. And now it is our delight, not drudgery, to do the law of God. To be law-abiding people. Not because we have to, but because we want to. Matthew 5, verse 17, Christ did not come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 4, right? If we look at, you know, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, right? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law, this is what people are trying to do through their works righteousness, might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But it gets better. Check out what Paul says next. He says this in verses 3 and 4, if we can advance the slide. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. 
by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. I know we just read that. We're just going to read it again this morning. Because it's that good, right? And then Romans chapter 3, verse 20, 22. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. This means works righteousness will get you nowhere. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, right, for all who are in Christ, whether you're male, female, Jew, Gentile, uh, employed, unemployed, Democrat, Republican, all who are in Christ Jesus are made one. There it is. And so, Christ suffers the penalty we deserve for our failure to keep God's law. But by his perfect obedience in keeping the law and suffering the law's curse, which we were supposed to suffer for, we now are now the recipients of eternal life and declared set free. When we trust Christ, ladies and gentlemen, and put our, and God puts our sin on him, and he imputes his righteousness to us, only after putting our trust in Christ and receiving the indwelling spirit can you begin to even obey God's law. If you love me, Jesus says, you will obey my commandment. Obedience to the law is not something that's optional. It is something that we desire to do. Last point, and we'll finish with this. Then we have baptism. Guide. Once you've been delivered, redeemed, rescued by God, we now have a guide. The law renews life's direction. It gives us a, it's a lamp into our feet. It's a light into our path. The law is good. Read Psalm 19 this week, right? God has made himself known in the heavens, but he also says the law is amazing, right? The commandments that God gives us are not prison bars, but they're traffic laws. Aren't you glad that there's a stoplight at Rural and, and, and Ray? And aren't you glad there's a stoplight at Cooper and, and Chandler? And aren't you glad that there's posted speed limits? Because everybody left to themselves would just drive however they want, and there would just be ambulance after ambulance after ambulance if there were no traffic laws. Praise God, right? Praise God for boundaries. Right? The law is not this legal guilt for those of us in Christ. Now it's a loving expression of a God who says, you're no longer in the courtroom. You're now in my household. Love me and live for me. So salvation, ladies and gentlemen, isn't reward for obedience. Salvation is a reason for obedience. It's a response to what God has done. Some verses write down. Well, I'll just leave you. You can look at these later. Romans 13. You cannot stop or separate God's love from God's law and vice versa. Romans 13. No, owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So, right? Love God, love others. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. They're summed up in this one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Paul continues, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. You owe no debt to any person but to love them as you've been loved by God in Christ. Whew. So we, now we live for God and we enjoy him. So live as people who are free. And don't use your freedom as an opportunity for sin. Live as people who are called to freedom. Because real obedience to God, even though it's all imperfect in our lives, is made possible because of Jesus who has given us a new life and the spirit that breathes in us power to live for God's glory and your good every single day. Next week, commandment number one. All this, because we're going to refer back to these things. And I guarantee you, God's word with the Spirit of God among God's people is going to have a transformative impact. Have you been blessed today and have you been encouraged today? I pray so. And if not, baptisms may do that to you. We're going to do that. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for truth and grace. 
Thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our salvation. Thank you that those of us who know you through Christ are no longer in a culture of death. We Now we live in this environment of life. Thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, that you've adopted us into your family. And there's nothing we can do to make you love us any less, and there's nothing that we can do to make you love us any more. You love us perfectly in Jesus. Show us the path, Father. Show us the the freedom. Give us a taste of that, of, of just what it means to live for you. May every corner of our lives have the flashlight of your word shine upon it so that nothing we do is not for your glory. That doesn't somehow reflect the good news of the gospel. We who have been delivered, we have been forgiven, we have been loved. Let us be those people in this world. The world is lost, the world is tired, the world is dead. And yet we are able to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to those environments. Help us to be faithful in that. Thanks for today. Thank you for baptism. Thank you for the people that have stepped forward in this act of obedience to say, I want to be associated with you, O oh God. Bless our time now. Thank you for your love for us in Christ, and we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Let's go outside on the patio and celebrate with those being baptized. Love you guys.